uh, I would like to welcome you to this webinar around uh, waste management around the world or about. Um, yeah, and today I'm not alone here from Sustainability Week International. Uh, with me is Josh um, from Green Africa Youth Organization. And yeah, he's uh, showing a little bit a different view on the whole situation. That's also why we um, called it around the world. So we have like global north and global south view in this webinar, I would like, I would say. Um, so, uh, Josh, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, thank you, Patrick. I'm happy to be here and happy to have everyone here. Um, so, as Patrick said, um, we be looking forward to um, more or less um, telling the story of waste management from both uh, perspectives, um, emerging economies and more developed um, economies. Um, also sort of putting emphasis on the countries where we both have worked uh, in the waste management sector, uh, as well as our knowledge on the waste management sector and experience within uh, other parts of the two uh, sort of global and global south. Uh, economy. So I look forward to, to sharing these details and uh, please if you have any questions um, you can drop it in the chat and you have a Q&A at the end as well so we can discuss a little bit. Yeah. Great. So um, yeah, I'm Joshua Puntim. I'm the uh, Executive Director and co-founder of Green Africa Youth Organization and we work with communities uh, in Ghana um, basically on climate change issues uh, and part of that is quite significantly more present for people at the community level is waste management uh, because the climate conversation is sometimes a bit abstract for, for, for some communities whereas waste management is very present because they can see the risk of this is also part of the work we do and I'll go into details of some of the um, some of the sort of uh, substantial uh, work that we're doing. So, um, Sort of highlights of the presentation. Next, um, I will talk about sort of the overall situation with waste management in emerging economies. So I'll look at sort of focus on Ghana a little bit, and I'll look at interventions and uh, emerging technologies within the sector, and what we can do as individuals uh, with regard to waste management. Uh, yeah, if we're thinking about projects uh, or yeah, some sort of interventions that we would want to do uh, support uh, in terms of uh, managing waste. In, in a much better way. So generally waste management, Patrick next, yeah. So generally waste management uh, refers to sort of the supervised handling of waste materials from generation uh, as source to the recovery process to disposal. Um, from this definition, typically most of the challenges is not uh, in, in most areas of the world, also part of the sort of the growing economies and the developing world, uh, is the collection, the transport. There is a bit of infrastructure for this, but the processing and recovery part is where the, the biggest challenges and sometimes it's completely missing. Uh, and then it goes straight to disposal. Um, I have a sort of a chat from the OECD countries, uh, who are I think about 36 countries. Uh, Particularly, can go next. Yeah, so this is a, a very simple uh, chart of 36 countries of the OECD uh, program. And they looked at all these countries to see sort of waste generation, how how they manage the waste and rank them. So it's for the Global Waste Index 2019. And out of this index, um, what I wanted to see here is unaccounted waste, which is the last, last but one uh, uh, column. You see that for, for most countries, they're still out of these 10 who are like the top 10 in terms of managing their waste well, you still see quite a, a problem with unaccounted waste, which even shows that in the developed world uh, and together with the developing countries, there's still an issue with waste collection uh, uh, per se, that you, you still have an amount of waste which is not collected and still get the sort of, you can't really account for it. And this is ending up in the ocean or in the natural environment uh, and sort of disturbing the ecosystem some way somehow. Um, if you go next, uh, I will sort of focus more on the, the emerging economies. 
and I will show the situation for. Um, yeah, so the, also a, a picture is coming next about uh, how the situation is for, for developing countries where about we have almost 2 billion people who are currently not having um, access to solid waste management. And this picture speaks to it, that you have an urban center, this is in India, you have an urban center where waste is just sitting on the street. This makes it very visible compared to uh, uh, countries or more developed countries where they generate even more waste. Uh, but then you don't have the visible sitting in the city or in the communities because there is some sort of infrastructure that allows for this waste to, to, to get out of the street. So this is the situation for emerging economies that you have really lack of infrastructure. People do not have access to any waste management services at all. Uh, so you generate waste and it's just sitting down until the central government has the capacity to, to, to pick it up. Um, I'm sort of the next slide I will show some data, also something quite interesting. So I hope you can all see fairly okay on your screen. So this is the data for the Asian Pacific region, um, where you see that the, the focus here is the composition of waste and how waste generation changes from based on your economic income or your yeah, income per capita. Um, and you can see here that as the lower the low economy people or people with low income generate more organic waste and the more money you have, the more your waste generation towards plastic and more disposable. So if you look at paper and cardboard and plastic, as the money goes up, they generate more of this waste and the organic waste generation reduces. Um, and this is also the same for not just for the Asia Pacific region, but also for Africa, for Latin America, that we generate more organic waste than plastic waste. For us, when you go to the very urban dense areas, there is more disposable being plastic um, compared to organic waste. Also from this uh, table, you see that the waste regulations are very poorly defined for countries who are sort of uh, emerging and not very quite developed also with low income that the regulations are very loose. You struggle to get really data to back up uh, the work you want to do in terms of intervention. Whereas the more income uh, or the more higher the GDP, the higher the regulations, the better they are, and uh, the more strict regulations are. Um, additionally, if you look at the last uh, tab, uh, it looks into disposal rate. Um, it looks into disposal rate. I hope you can uh, hear me now, and I'll try to speak slowly as well. Um, so the disposal rate for uh, and the recycling rate also the same that for, for low income economies, this is really low. Uh, and then you have uh, waste going directly to a dump site uh, and there's sort of no facility for recycling. Um, for us, when you go to medium, they have landfill facility, which sometimes help uh, uh, in terms of managing, uh, as well as uh, even more better uh, economic uh, countries will have Sort of even more advanced recycling facilities, uh, incineration uh, as, uh, as possibilities. Um, in the next slide, I'll try to zoom in to Ghana, um, where we have most of our projects, uh, to talk about how the situation is, uh, which is also the same for most uh, uh, emerging economies as well in developing countries. So, in, in most of these countries, the waste is largely a property, if I can put it that way, a property of the local government. So the waste belongs to the local government. If you generate waste in your community, of course you generated the waste, it sits wherever it sits, but it's the responsibility of the local government to deal with it, which makes it their property. It also means that you cannot, someone as a normal person, you cannot go and take this waste if you've not been contracted to do that. Um, so whatever happens to the waste is the responsibility of, of the, of the, of the sort of the local government itself. Um, the challenge is that this, this, this sort of government offices lack the infrastructure, they lack the financial resource as well, and they lack the, the human resource as well to manage with this waste, uh, which then leads to very poor waste management. Um, like I said before, most of our waste is organic waste, so 65%. Uh, it, I mean, this is sort of more average for us if you go to the urban, very dense urban centers like Accra, the organic waste is a little bit less, whereas when you go to the rural areas, it's much more. Um, and out of this 
high quantity of organic waste. Uh, we still generate 1.7 million tons of plastic annually, and um, just around 10% um, uh, of this waste is recycled, which is a mouthful of uh, a global statistics. Whereas locally in Ghana, we do not have very strict data on how much waste generated in Ghana is being recycled because of what recycling actually means, and I'll come to that um, just in a bit. Uh, a special case for Ghana is also electronic waste, uh, which is uh, we host one of the world's biggest e-waste dump sites in the world. Um, uh, and um, this is called a Boboloshi uh, dump site. Um, and just quite several interventions to uh, manage electronic waste at, at this site. None of these have been proven to be successful. There's been a lot of uh, development aid trying to support this, but it cannot be dealt with because there is not so much regulation around electronic waste coming in from Europe and from the US mostly, as well as China. So there's a lot of importation of electronic waste, um, most of which are already closer to end of life. So they come into the country, people purchase it, and about a year or two, it, it's already dead, cannot function anymore. And because we are not manufacturers of these uh, electronics, we have limitations to how, how far we can fix them, uh, which then leads to having a lot of electronic waste uh, going into uh, this dump site. Um, and I'll go also a bit into how we, how we manage uh, these, these waste. Um, next slide, Patrick. Yeah. So um, the structure for waste management in Ghana is that we collect. Uh, which is the photo you see now. So for every district, for every location, uh, the, the local government will have a contract with a waste management company. And as you can see from the photo, what this company does is they go, they sweep around, and then they gather the waste, and they take it to this central point, which is where they're at now. So you see these containers. The waste goes into these containers, and then the waste management company will lift these containers and transport the waste. And usually, they transport it to either a landfill site, which we only have, I think, just three or four in the country, and the rest are just dump sites. Um, next, Patrick. And when it gets to this point, usually this is a photo of myself at, the, at one of these sites where I work. Uh, so they mix everything, so there's no segregation. It's just basically collecting the waste, transporting it to this site. And at this site, sort of the easiest way to deal with it uh, for most of the districts or the, the local government is to burn it, set fire to the waste, uh, which of course is a lot of pollution for communities staying nearby this, this site, uh, which is also not sustainable for the environment, contributes a lot of uh, methane and carbon as well, which uh, contributes to climate change, um, if you can say so. Uh, next. And this is the video. Uh, Patrick, if you can click on it, I hope it plays. It's a very short video. Great. Okay, so you see this drain, exactly, this is just what I want to show. So this drain is, is in, a, in the city of Accra, which is Ghana's capital, just around uh, the uh, Osula Badi Beach. Now, it's a very beautiful place, actually. But then this is the effect of improper waste management, that you have all these plastic waste going into the drains, blocking the drains so the water cannot flow any, anymore. And when we have heavy rainfall, this leads to flooding because the rain cannot really um, uh, flow anymore because of all this uh, plastic waste that uh, we have clogging the gutters. Um, next slide. Once, once the waste is transported to this dump site, this is how it looks like. You have a mountain of, of waste, unsegregated, all mixed up, electronic, um, plastic, organic waste. Uh, even sometimes hazardous, all mixed up on this one site. Uh, part of the process is that you have, uh, so to say, um, people who pick waste or informal waste takers who contribute significantly to waste management in emerging economies and developing countries because they recover, they recover parts of this waste, which is more useful, and then trade it or sell it to waste management companies uh, to use this. The only thing is that if you look at this mountain of waste and imagine someone working on this site, this is highly, highly uh, hazardous. I mean, occupational health and hazard is very, very high. 
for people who do this work. They are not contracted by the waste management uh, um, offices within the, the local government because these are individuals and they are not having a company which is registered, which is also part of the work that Green Africa Youth Organization is doing to mobilize informal waste pickers, show their capacity, and allow them to be awarded contracts that allow them to recover waste even more safer than having the waste come to this site before they recover the useful part. Um, and like I said before, uh, Patrick, next slide. Uh, typically, what is done, um, yeah, next slide. But typically, what is done is that the waste is being bent to reduce the volumes because there's nothing else they could do when you don't segregate the waste and everything is all crammed together. There is little to nothing you can actually do to, to turn it into something useful. Uh, and hence, they have to burn it, uh, sort of all the volumes to reduce it so that they can keep dumping waste on these sites. The picture on the left is the case of the electronic waste where they have to even burn it before they recover the useful parts. So they, they want to get access to the motors in the fridge, the, the copper wires uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the sort of the motherboard of the computers. They want to get all these things. And sometimes, especially for the fridges, what they do is to burn set fire to it. And then as the plastic and as sort of the covering bent away, they quench the fire and recover the useful material. Also for like wires, uh, which we use in computer accessories, um, they, they set fire to it, as you can see. So this guy would just drop all these wires into the fire. And once it burns to a certain level where they can see the actual metal, the, the copper uh, in, the, in the wires, they just quench the fire and recover these metals. And this is sort of the standard way of managing waste um, uh, in Ghana and many parts across West Africa, across Sub-Saharan Africa, also parts of Asia, in Latin America, we know this is a problem that is happening. Um, and this is also why we're having this conversation today to see how we move on to a, a more better waste management strategy. Next part. So what we're doing now, the structure I've described so far is very linear. Uh, you take the waste, you take the raw material, you make a product out of it, you get a waste, and then you dispose it. This is very uh, sort of the practice I projected so far, which is what is happening. Um, and of course, over the past uh, decade, there's been a lot of increased um, awareness for uh, emerging economies to move towards a more regular uh, waste management structure. Uh, but this also comes with its own sort of um, hindrances. Um, so a more secular approach will mean that you, you get a raw material, you manufacture a product, the consumer uses the product, and then the waste goes back as a raw material into the manufacturing sector. Um, part of what has been breached as part of the sustainable way of managing waste for us to get to this point, uh, next slide, Patrick, is the five hours, which is very common. Uh, so use, reduce, reuse, recover, and recycle. Typically, what most uh, sort of the main trade or the main work which is used uh, when it comes to waste management is recycle. Um, I remember when I was doing my bachelor's back in 2014, um, recycle was like the word, the go-to word, okay, we need to move to recycling. But the whole country, uh, Ghana with almost 25 million at that time, had only one recycling plant. Um, so how do you use this as a solution when you have just one infrastructure which is sitting somewhere in the city when the whole country requires uh, this infrastructure to recycle. Re regardless, NGOs, development organizations, this is what they were preaching, recycle, 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 despite the lack of infrastructure to actually recycle. Um, there are other options being refusing, which means not accepting any material that you really don't need or you know you will use it for just a couple of seconds and you will dispose it. You don't really have to take this material or reducing, which is just producing with less material and also as an individual, making sure that you do not generate uh, waste, um, that reducing your waste generation. Um, we use giving products that can like, can like hot life, uh, using products over and over again until you actually cannot use them anymore and then disposing properly or even recovering first uh, before it goes on to recycle. Uh, recovering is being done uh, in emerging economies, mainly for the e-waste sector, 
because the sort of the material you recover from electronics have quite a higher commercial value and ha hence there is sort of a economic incentive for people to participate uh, in uh, sort of managing recovery uh, with from the evil sector and then recycling which is sort of the most common most used and yet we do not have infrastructure for that but even if we had the infrastructure would this have been the best solution next slide so far we know that only nine percent of all uh, plastic uh, ever discarded since 1950 have been recycled. This is a research that Greenpeace, uh, Break Free from Plastic Movement, and the Global Alliance for Incinerate Alternative Trip, and they launched this, uh, I think, in 2018, uh, which made it very obvious that recycling is not enough, and there's a whole campaign about that. Um, so, even for countries where this, this infrastructure is available, it's still very obvious that if you really Going to deal with waste management from a very sustainable point of view, recycling is not even enough. And just putting this across also for people who want to work within sort of the, the developing country context that yes, recycling, you hear a lot of people say, yeah, recycling, we could do recycling, or it's a solution, it's an approach. The infrastructure is not there. And even if the infrastructure was there, it wouldn't be enough to, to, to deal with the quantity or volumes of waste we generate. Next slide, Patrick. So in terms of intervention, given that, I mean, these are sort of possible things we could do um, to, to manage the waste that we have in emerging economies. And the most important thing for me is organics, given that over 65% of waste across all um, developing countries is still made up of organic waste, is that we really look at how we convert organic waste into compost, also because most of these economies depend on agriculture. And given the high rate of flooding and drought happening across the sub-Saharan region, also with along the, the East Asian region, this flooding washed away soil nutrients, creating a demand for fertilizer. And we know that in this country, there's high demand for fertilizer use. And in my country, Ghana, for instance, there's even a government uh, project which supplies fertilizer to farmers. But how can we convert organic waste into fertilizers so like that we and fit this into the circular waste management approach. For plastics, there are different possibilities like repurposing plastics. So if you do not have the recycling facility, how could you still put sort of single use plastics or use plastics into better use aside reusing them if you cannot? Um, there's recycling. And most cases when people also in developing countries talk about recycling, usually it's more collecting it, shredding it, and exporting it to be recycled some way. They do not, mostly we do not have the recycling facilities in the country. So for instance, Ghana, all the recycling companies, all the recycling companies are shredding the waste, which means breaking it into pieces, compacting, and then transporting it to other parts of the world for it to be then properly recycled or made into other products. There are new technologies coming up, like using plastic waste for construction material like making towels, pavement blocks, and roofing. The question is, is this sustainable in the long term? What if these things are breaking apart? And then, of course, we know that the situation with microplastics, once you break this into smaller pieces, uh, and if you use them for, say, pavement blocks, and it's raining, at some point, wear and tear will come in, and then this is also going to underground water, and then forming part um, of, of the larger uh, hydrological uh, system. So is this still a better solution? Something to think about. Uh, E-waste is still what we know it to be. We are only able to recover essential parts and then sometimes being used to refurbish mobile phones or ions and fridges and also exporting these materials to scores the countries where the manufacturers are based so they can use this for manufacturing again, which doesn't really help us a lot because we then become like more or less a dump site as an emerging country, we do not produce, we rather we do receive used products or sometimes new products, but then we use it and we cannot fix them because we are not having the capacity to produce, which means we can't fix fully, which also becomes a problem. So given all these approaches still, municipal solid waste remains a challenge. Um, something for us to consider, uh, given that I believe that everybody in this, on this call is interested to see how we can move on. And I have the next slide shows just a couple of things that we can consider when planning intervention. Um, I see 
for developing countries activities around risk management should come with some sort of historical background how people have managed waste already in the past before it became a big problem like this we need to pay attention to that secondly it's more about livelihood and survival people need jobs and which so this really does the case for green jobs to sort of use this waste management challenge to set up a structure which allows for green jobs uh, and for people to, to earn a livelihood out of this uh, so the questions to consider when planning an intervention would be what can we learn from the challenges within the community and how do we take advantage of that how do you empower the community people to understand the challenge at hand and also the intervention that you are introducing to the community to do the risk that they have um how would you could you make them see your solution or your intervention as something that is not an extra burden because in our experience if someone has to walk say 500 meters to put their waste uh, in a bin compared to if they can just leave it anywhere and there's no regulation that will punish them i mean they are not going to walk 500 meters to go to that point they will just drop it wherever they can so how do we get them to see intervention as not an extra burden to them in terms of even segregating waste, which is very important? Why do they have to, what's the cost of getting three separate beans or even separating the waste in the first place, which might take some time? How do you get them to understand this? How do you eliminate sort of trade-offs? Okay, if I'm walking 500 meters to dispose my waste, or if I'm segregating my waste, what do I get in return? from putting in this commitment. So these are things that we have to consider and how do we also make sure that at every step of the waste management chain, that there is value for the people who are engaged in this sector. Next slide, Patrick. I'll quickly just run through a project that we are doing in Ghana, uh, which is also sort of this community approach and trying to answer some of these questions about. The three photos you see here is uh, sort of uh, an illustration of what we are doing. So we are repurposing single-use plastics because the, the sort of the plastic industry itself is not managing this because they do not recycle it because it's, it's just not recyclable anymore, which means it goes to the dump site and it gets spent. So on the photo on the left, the first photo from your left, is converting these single-use plastics into raincoats so people can use it over and over and over again. Uh, and this is something that is also creating jobs for local people uh, that we train them how to do this. Uh, young girls who are out of school, do not have jobs, they can go into this as a business and they set up their own enterprise where they produce it. Um, the second photo to your right is also converting agricultural waste like coconut husk into briquettes uh, for, for cooking or into charcoal for cooking. So people do not have to rely on deforestation to cook. So also taking advantage of the waste management problem of burning the waste and rather converting it into something more sustainable that can be used. Uh, and if you don't know what briquette is, I think in, 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 in a more developed world, you, this is what you use for the barbecue during the summer. Uh, and on the last photo, uh, which is best from your right, uh, is uh, a compost uh, which is being about to be packaged. And also this is a project we do where we collect organic waste from the communities, compost it and then package it and give it to farmers. I will try to wrap up very quickly. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to go so much into the next two slides. I'm just trying to draw the linkage between waste management and the SDGs, why waste management is very important, and also to get everyone to understand that waste management is not really giving the attention that it needs, because mostly we're talking about more sort of climate change and uh, sustainability very broad terms. Uh, without, I mean, waste management relates to almost four of the SDGs if you really want to achieve that. Um, and, and this has to do with sustainable cities, good health and well-being, uh, res responsible consumption and production, clean water and sanitation. All these are very important as well as life below water, because we know that all these plastics are getting into, into water now, and we even know that there could be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So this is very important. Uh, and sort of drawing your attention to it to sort of prioritize in terms of that designing projects and waste management is something that is really critical if you really want to achieve sort of sustainable development. Uh, um, next two slides. Okay, so way forward, brilliant. So 
just sort of the last uh, thing I leave for everyone to look into is that um, we need to increase education and awareness on the refuse, reduce, and reuse in developing countries because the recycling facilities are not there. We do not have the infrastructure. We do not have infrastructure for waste segregation. So our best shot in really managing waste well is first of all to refuse, reduce uh, the, our waste generation, lower the quantities, like that the small quantity we produce, we can be able to manage it effectively. Uh, and also reusing so that we do not overwhelm the capacity of the few waste management resources that is available. Capacity building and media engagement for citizen uh, waste management is very important because, like I said, the, the government uh, will not have the capacity to manage the waste that we are generating, and hence, all of us have to get involved one way, one way or the other. And for us to get involved, everyone must be educated on it and must understand what they need to do. Um, I know that technology and digital innovation is something that is coming up with a lot of young people and also with this generation uh, that we have. And hence, there's an opportunity to also look into innovation such as uh, collecting, mainly for collecting and processing that we can have apps that allow for sort of increased waste management uh, within our community. And the last point is that wherever we are, we should advocate for producers of these, uh, especially consumable materials uh, material for companies like Coca-Cola, Unilever, Nestle, who are producing a lot uh, in, in, in developing countries, to think about their packaging solutions, packaging design, like that these things are more sustainable and do not overwhelm the countries where they're operating in dealing with these waste. And as well as pushing for policies that allow the government to put a higher responsibility on these producers, so like that they have to really take care of the waste and the food that they put on the market and the waste that comes out of it. So this is it for me, and thank you very much. Um, on the last slide, Patrick, you will see a photo of, um, of uh, a fisherman uh, in Cape Coast, and I took this photo in 2015, where they pulled a net, and they had different things. You can even see a, tele a computer case, a monitor case, all parts of it, as well as bottles and cans, and a lot of plastic waste coming from this, and this was back in 2016. So you can imagine what it would be now um, if we do not really manage our waste well. Thanks very much, and um, over to you, Patrick. Thanks a lot, Josh. Um, we have two questions, if you want to answer them right now. Um, I can read them. Uh, would energy companies be interested in collecting the trash and burn it in order to create energy? Okay, quick quick response to that. Yes, this would be interesting for for energy companies, but currently we do not have sort of the combined heat and power uh, generators in Ghana, which, which sort of uses waste to generate electricity. We do not have this in Ghana yet. Uh, there are projects looking into that. The challenge with this is that for you to be able to do this, you have to enhance the collection capacity of, of the country or the city where you are putting this machine. If not, you are not able to get all the volumes you need to feed these uh, incinerators or uh, these uh, technologies that uh, convert um, burn waste and convert it into electricity. But yes, this would be certainly interesting, but we have to fix the waste collection rate first so we can get the volume to be able to even do this. Perfect. And the second question, do you have any proposed alternative to recover resources from the landfills? Or do you think nothing can be done and those mixed waste have reached its end life? And if you have, what are those? Okay. Um, so if I understand correctly, what the, the, the point would be that once the waste is mixed, that's the problem. Once the waste is mixed and it gets to that dump site, it's really, really difficult to do anything with it. This is the first problem. So at that point, the only intervention will be that people are going there and they are like literally using their hands to go through all this heap of waste. This is very, very hazardous to recover the good part. The alternative will be that we strengthen segregation of source, or at least, I mean, I know in South Africa, I know some parts of Asia as well, what they do is instead of putting the waste at the dump site, they put all of it in sort of a, a room and then people are separating it like literally with their hands in that room which is a bit more okay and then they have a machine 
which can also separate all the sort of light plastics using air blowing. So they blow air over the waste and all the light plastic go to one side. So this can be done. But the best approach which I recommend is that projects should focus on uh, being able to facilitate segregation at source. This would be the best way of recovery so that it's easier to get all the materials needed. Because even for recycling, when the plastics are mixed with oil and, and paint and other things, you can't really work with it. It just goes to incineration or burning. So the best approach would be to, first of all, segregate it so you can actually recover the useful part and use it for something more beneficial. Thanks. Uh, one more question popped up. Is there any key idea or unique or quick idea that can be, accept, uh, that can be acceptable by local governments to manage municipal uh, waste from Kathmandu in Nepal? Uh, in Nepal, yeah, I, I have a bit of context to, 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 to Nepal. Um, I think that the, the challenge is that the ideas are not the problem because we can always learn from the north, from, from developing countries, but it's been done like incinerated or uh, even better recycling companies and all that. The challenge with a city, city like a city like Kathmandu is that the city does not have the financial capacity to invest in all this infrastructure. That is not there from a more sort of local government perspective. They do not have this. The best way is to have zero waste approaches. This is the project we are also doing in Ghana, uh, to have a zero waste approach where you break the communities into smaller components and allow every small community to deal with their waste because at that point, the volumes are small. They know it's their responsibility. And if they really know that they do not have the capacity to manage large volumes of waste, they will not generate large volumes of waste. But once you have a big city with one agency dealing with all their waste, nobody really thinks about the volumes they just generated, hoping that just one agency will deal with it and the agency does not have the capacity. So the recommendation would be, given the lack of financial resource and infrastructure, let's adopt the zero waste approach, which means that we reduce all the waste generation which we cannot manage and rather focus on if you're going to generate any waste, it should be organic, we can convert that into compost, we can create jobs out of it. And then the, the plastics and the electronic waste and hazardous waste really strengthen education and capacity on reducing these volumes of waste. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, one other question. Awareness. Um, I agree composting organic matter is the simplest, most effective, low-cost solution if people would just do it. Awareness campaign to compost at home or in the local neighborhood. That is more. Yeah, I mean, a quick reaction to that would be that people will not do composting by themselves. This is something we know already. Back in the days, I mean, in the 1990s, when I was a kid, for instance, we used to do composting at home. Every home would do a backyard garden. We don't have that anymore because of just general urbanization and modernization. We do not do this. From a zero waste perspective, what you would do, like I said, if you have a community in a sm smaller zones, every community could have their composting site which means it's a more community approach. You can have a couple of entrepreneurs taking leadership on this, taking all the waste from the houses, the organic waste, and taking it to that site. Because if you have a big community, you can't manage this. If you break it into smaller zones, you can have two or three entrepreneurs with their price cycle, which we know this is what most developing countries are using to collect waste anyways, but they only focus on the organics. They take it to this waste uh, composting site and they practice composting there. And then they sell it to, to the farmers, and also to the sort of the offices or rooftop garden and all that. But if you leave it as, yeah, people should just compost at home, they won't do it. This is very uh, feasible. We, we know this because they just have different livelihoods. And if they are not earning any income from this, or the volumes are too little and this is not a business, they are going to do something else for their livelihood and to earn income. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Josh, for all the insights. Um, yeah, so. I will take over the next part of the presentation, try to be kind of short. Um, you all know me that I'm co-president of Sustainability Week International, but that is not already justifying my background, uh, why I should speak about waste. Um, my background on waste is coming from my um, Master of Science in Energy and Environmental Engineering. So I studied this for quite some times and currently, I'm working as a process engineer in research and development 
on environmental technology, um, especially on the recovery side. So um, this was already, uh, yeah, uh, elaborated by, by Josh, so I will not go too much into detail. We have these uh, steps. You should try to reduce, reuse, repair, uh, recycle or recover at least. And if there is no other way, um, for whatever reason, um, then it will be just disposed. And that's not a really good idea. Um, my presentation is going mainly about this field for the moment because that's where uh, the technology mainly is coming in. This is the situation in a lot of different uh, countries, um, some out of Europe, but a lot of a lot of them still inside Europe. So also in Europe, there is not um, we cannot say like everyone is is well developed in 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 that uh, terms. Um, you see the light green is uh, material recovery, so that means recycling and composting. The dark green is incineration, so just burn the waste and recover the energy from it. Um, and we have a dark red incineration without energy recovery that is not done very often. It also doesn't make too much sense. Um, and the landfill. And you can see, depending on the region, especially al also in Eastern Europe, there is still 50% um, or even more of the waste is going to, to landfill still. Uh, yeah, so this is the lowest uh, part of the pyramid, which we actually don't want to reach. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Switzerland. Why? Because uh, Switzerland is on the very top of um, reducing, not not reducing, but recycling and um, and recovery of waste, uh, we do not have any direct landfill. Um, this is mainly due to the regulations here, which were established in the 90s, that it's basically not uh, allowed to bring any waste to direct landfill. Why is that not done? Um, the problem with such a landfill as we have it in emerging countries um, or also in more developed countries still is uh, several problems. We have gas emissions from these uh, dump sites for more than 10 years, so methane uh, basically, um, which is also um, harming the climate. It of course uh, causes a lot of disease to the people working and sometimes even living there. And what you also have is uh, a water pollution from this landfill site. So this affects the groundwater um, after some times when um, rainwater comes into these landfills. Um, a bit more advanced landfills, they try to, to uh, cover them uh, at the bottom so that no water is running through the landfill or at least will be um, catched at the bottom. But um, yeah, that is not always working. And this is really uh, also very long-term um, pollution. I will come to, to an example from that, uh, what we have done in Switzerland about that later on. Um, the recycling basics is also uh, a little bit regarding the question, it's not recycling, but also for the recovery, it's pretty similar um, for the question that was raised about if it's interesting for um, energy companies to, to rec uh, recover energy from the waste. Um, we have to say that usually uh, this is um, yeah, quite costly. You have to, to to pass over these um, costs for the infrastructure and also for the operation. So what we usually have, and the same for all the recycling materials, is um, that we have a gate fee basically for uh, receiving these uh, wastes. Doesn't matter uh, what kind, it can be a biogas plant from organic waste, it can also be um, other recycling, uh, recycling um, facilities uh, like for electronic waste in, in Switzerland we have like um, 
a fee that you actually even pay when you uh, buy the product so that is already assured that you will bring it back because you do not have to pay and in the end um, yeah and you will also see what happens to this um, uh, or you will see in the next slide what what is uh, what will be causing this and also why we have problems like the electronic waste going from uh, developed countries to um, emerging countries like Ghana. Um, so this is kind of a really nice graph to to see where different recycling uh, is lying. So we have some market-driven recycling like glass, paper, and especially the metal. Um, for alloy, it's, it takes so much more energy to um, get alloy from, uh, from the ground resources instead of just recycling it. Uh, I think it's only about 5% of the energy used for, for recycling alloy uh, or aluminium, uh, not alloy, uh, aluminium. So um, yeah, they even with, within high standards or high uh, regulations, for the environment, it's it makes absolutely sense to recycle these materials uh, in place, and that's also what we do. And we do not even have to pay additionally when we're bringing back glass or paper. Um, there is also some part of really unnecessary recycling we see sometimes uh, in developed countries. There are things like chewing gum recycling boxes and that stuff that just makes absolutely no sense and there is not even uh, an ecological uh, benefit and also no profit. Then what we have is this section of regulation driven recycling. So that's for example the plastic recycling or electronic device recycling um, that have uh, an ecological advantage. So it makes uh, from an ecological perspective sense to recycle this but it costs more than just take uh, new products um, and there is a little bit of a uh, critical or this is the critical section of recycling in the developing countries because there is like uh, you have through these um, regulations you get higher costs for the recycling so what can you do you just try to go around the regulations and you can do that uh, maybe cheaper in some emerging countries where people will be willing without any regulations to for example for the plast uh, for the electronic waste to just burn cables um, outside um, they take all the risk uh, and and all the the dirt coming from these actions um, yeah, because they are basically market driven, they get something for the for the copper. And this is what we kind of like to prevent because um, yeah, that's not what regulations are made for. We want to have in the end an ecological uh, advantage with recycling, otherwise it makes no sense. And that's why these things, basically it's in Europe, it's uh, prohibited to um, export uh, already damaged electronic devices um, we have uh, but still there is a lot of problem that um, not all the electronic devices sent to Africa are really working or uh, on the other hand they may be as Josh already said like just shortly before the end of their life and we are ending up with the same problem um, so what uh, looks recycling like in Switzerland, uh, you see all these different signs or all signs from recycling. I took them from the Swiss recycling page. Um, we have a huge load of recycling things. And also in Switzerland, it is uh, quite sure or quite safe that we do not export too much waste. Um, there are some examples on the plastic waste, for example, um, that we know that is uh, there are some companies that claim to be really um, doing plastic recycling very well and recover all the materials but they're often working with wrong numbers wrong figures and they're also sending the plastic waste uh, to other countries maybe just around for the first step but we don't know what these countries are doing then with it and it may end up uh, in the plastic 
big plastic dump sites um, earlier times in China and after China closed there uh, or refused to, to receive all this plastic waste from all over the world in 2018. Um, now it's, I think, the big dump sites for plastics uh, are uh, Malaysia and some other um, Asian countries down there. So just if you don't know all of these signs, uh, I'm not going to, to, to name all of them, but you see like there is a huge variety of things that uh, can be recycled here. Also, we have some quotes for that. 36% um, of batteries uh, for PET bottles, drinking bottles, there is 82%. Uh, 94 for uh, aluminium cans, only the cans, not the overall aluminium. But you also see that this is uh, rather market driven, so that makes sense for for uh, people to recycle that. We have an overall recycling quote of 52%. That's also what you have seen in the graph uh, in the very beginning. And the other um, part of the waste um, will be incinerated. And this uh, will be the slide next. So this is basically the uh, scheme of uh, waste incineration plant. You can see the waste uh, will be brought by um, uh, carriers and it goes into a bunker, it will be burned. But what you can see from this slide is that a really big part of the whole plant is actually not the burning, that's a rather small part. But um, uh, let me see if I can use a pointer or something to show. So here you see, this is the oven basically where the waste is burnt. But all this part here basically is just um, heat recovery. So you have uh, heat exchangers here all over uh, to get the, the energy back from the waste that you burn here. and all this part down here, the whole thing here is just cleaning of the exhaust gas. So these plants are not only burning, so the, the, the main um, purpose of these plants is to clean the, the exhaust gas of this plant because um, as we have seen also from the slides of Josh that if you just burn that, you can do that, but the, the problem is that you harm the environment a lot by burning this, by all this, um, hazardous gas and so on. And then another very small part here is, is the, the turbine where you basically uh, create energy or, or recover the energy, get it back into either heat or into um, electricity. Um, for Switzerland, there is a really uh, high standard for these plants. They have to increase their energy efficiency more and more. So. Um, I think now the baseline is around 55% or even more um, what they have to reach as a minimum. So they, they, there is no possibility to have a waste incineration plant in Switzerland that is only uh, recovering um, electricity from it. You have to also use the heat and that brings some more problems towards um, infrastructure because you need either district heating system or uh, you need to have a, another plant um, close by which can use uh, heat so that means usually steam or hot water for some reasons um, but one example i will show next um, this is a plant in lucerne in switzerland it's I think the newest new built plant so far, because the history of waste incineration in Switzerland is quite old. It started somewhere uh, in the first decade of the 20th century. So I think 1906 or something was the first waste incinerator built in Switzerland somewhere around that time. So um, yeah, and also the whole uh, exhaust gas cleaning that is so important that came much later on. So in the beginning, these were not really, uh, really well developed and nice plants. So that is a quite long history. Um, you can see here the 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 waste receival. You can see 
uh, cranes in this new plant in Lucerne, this crane can operate fully automatically, so they need nobody to um, to operate it. Even this is quite difficult because um, it is necessary uh, that you have a look a little bit on what waste you put together. You, sh you cannot feed uh, only plastic waste, for example, at, at one time of point. Um, and then maybe only organic waste uh, at another time because the the heat value or, or calorific value of this waste is very different and what you uh, want to reach is a, a, um, a steady energy production. You can see also the uh, steering um, part of the plant or at least more observation of the plant. Um, this is the is the part of the heat exchangers so a huge uh, a huge box or however you want to call it and what you can see here are some explosion generators because uh, a problem that you face with these um, heat exchangers is that there are fouling you have a lot of dirt coming through that and they are um, obviously making the heat exchanger uh, less well working this is a uh, small picture of the fire so they actually have some windows where you can see really the waste burning it's quite impressive and this is the the turbine that uh, converts it into electricity and heat and in this plant in lucerne they have a paper recycling um, plant next to it and this one actually uses a lot of heat um, and this is now provided, the steam for that is provided now by this energy uh, from waste or waste incineration plant um, instead of buying oil. So that's also quite some advantage. But um, yeah, that's not always the case. Um, the other thing what you can do is um, treat the organic waste uh, if sorted separately, of course. Um, what is not done in Switzerland is it's done in some countries, also in Europe, um, that they try to um, separate uh, organic waste and municipal so uh, from municipal solid waste or, or whole mixed waste. Um, but this is really, really difficult, as, as also discussed before. If the waste is already completely mixed, um, the problem that you have, if you, for example, want to do composting, um, the the idea is that you that you keep the nutrients and that you go back with them uh, in a circle back to the back to the fields, right? So you can use it as a fertilizer. But if you have it um, mixed with municipal solid waste and you try to sort it, of course you will be able to do that until some uh, some point, but um, you will still have a huge plastic fraction impurities of organic waste um, it, uh, from municipal solid waste have uh, usually um, between 10 to 20 percent or maybe even more uh, plastic and other impurities inside and and if you bring them back to the to the field as a fertilizer then you will uh, accumulate um, these things uh, in in a place where you don't want to have them because that's not uh, you don't want to have these things in your food or whatever uh, other production so there are different basically two different um, types of organic waste treatment that we have this is on the left hand the composting direct composting what happens with composting or the only th you can either do that just on an open field um, yeah and just wait until the microbiology um, is working the other thing what happens actually at composting is that it gets uh, hot so there is a lot of energy released as well as you can see there is some uh, steam coming up from from the lower picture uh, over here so this is getting quite hot and what people do sometimes is they put the uh, they do the composting in fixed boxes so they can also uh, recover a little bit of heat of course that is a completely different temperature level uh, than burning waste uh, 
And the other thing, and that's also something that I'm working on, is um, uh, anaerobic digestion, it's called, or a biogas plant. Um, there are different technologies for rather fluid uh, substrates or for rather um, solid substrates. Uh, so you have a, a dry or wet um, anaerobic digestion technology. Um, I do not want to go too much into details, but what you basically do is you try to clean it from impurities as well, um, even if uh, sorted separately, and then you just bring it in a closed, uh, a closed um, digester where you just wait until the biology works um, and and gets the the gas out of it, or uh, yeah, and the ditch state you try to clean up again as well and to separate into liquid and solid and and you try to use that again if possible. But also here, the more impurities we have in the organic waste fraction, um, the less it can be used and and uh, farmers may also. Um, refuse to use it if it's too dirty. Um, yeah, these also some pictures I, I, I have from really visiting such a plant. Um, this one here is actually standing on top of the digester. This is the biogas upgrading. You can do either also use the CHP and create electricity and heat, or you can upgrade the biogas so it can be fed into the normal natural gas um, net because that is in place in, in some countries already. And this is what it looks inside of such a digester. So that's really, uh, yeah, looks kind of dirty, this place. Um, yeah, and some other stuff. This is uh, the, the, the liquid part of the Dutch state that you also try to use as far as possible again on the plant and if not used anymore you try to bring it to the fields but um it's not that welcomed anymore and in some countries actually they have put in place new regulations to not use liquid fertilizers from this plant anymore um one thing i wanted to point out is that uh, switzerland even we have uh, quite uh, some technologies in place to, to handle waste um, for recycling or recovery. Um, the landfill is not too far away from, from us in time. Um, this is, uh, so until the end of the 80s and even beginning of the 90s, we also had landfill, direct landfill. And this was a very interesting case here um, in Kölliken, in Switzerland, this was um, a landfill that was active only for a very short time from 1987 to 1985. And it was actually not meant for usual municipal waste, but for hazardous waste. Um, and yeah, you have some impressions here how this was back that time. What you can see and what was really stupid, and that's also uh, probably a reason why we treat um, waste or we started to think about waste earlier in Switzerland is that we are quite small and, and dense populated country. So you see this, this, this dump site is like extremely close to the houses. Um, yeah, this is just, and there was a, an awful um, odor coming from that. And also they found out later on that people actually didn't really know and were not checking very carefully what the companies that brought waste there and um, what they really dumped there. So it was kind of uh, very unknown. And this caused problems. Um, as you can see, there were actually also measurements um, that this was really polluting the, the groundwater in this region. And, and that was, of course, a huge problem here. Um, what the first thing they did was they tried to secure the landfill by by cover it up on the bottom and they tried to pump away the water that was going through this uh, landfill because from hazardous waste of course you have even you have even worse uh, pollution um and what they did in a second step because they really saw uh 
this this they they couldn't really get uh, rid of the pollution of the water pollution especially completely so the swiss government decided that this landfill will be completely removed they built this huge hall which you can see on the on the right upper side um on over the whole uh landfill place and then they completely closed it like um uh, air proof so there was no airflow between the inside and the outside of this of this hall and they started to remove all the waste they had to take samples um and so on and people could only work there uh inside of their um of their um how to say inside of their trucks or whatever um tools they needed there and only completely covered up so uh i have some video here about uh in in regards of time i'm not going to show this but you can do that later on it's quite uh, impressive to see and they try to uh take ropes and and find out what was really inside each of these barrels um and then they tried to to uh, recycle or uh, recover this um uh, in a way that that makes sense for for the waste they found so but that was a a, a, a huge project and you see also I, I i wrote it there it costed nearly one billion us dollar uh to do that and it took i think about 20 years um so i told you a lot now about technologies in switzerland or more developed countries but uh is everything perfect what we do in regards of waste and no it is absolutely not because as you can see here um, switzerland is on top uh, waste uh, municipal waste uh, producers uh, from the world only the us and denmark are, are even worse but denmark came uh, to the top position very recently i think we were uh, second before um so we have about 730 kilograms per year in capita so that's uh, a huge uh, amount of waste um yeah so what you can see when we go back to the slide we had in the beginning is that we are maybe good in the recycling and recovery um parts but what we really miss out and we never talk about too much because we are always proud on recycling quotes and whatever uh, is on all the upper parts of this whole pyramid um, with the reduce and reuse uh, and this is a, a, a point that i want to highlight that even if if uh, developed countries have a lot of technology in place sometimes it doesn't mean um, that they're doing everything perfectly Okay, that was it for now. Um, if there are any questions, also either to Josh or me, please feel free to ask them or put them in the chat box. We're happy to, to answer that. Here, I hear no questions, or I can see no no questions. You can also reach out to to us later on. You have the contact data here on all the social media and website and email and so on. So, Hita actually has a comment. Okay, Hita, yeah, go on. Hi, uh, thank you. I don't really have a question. It's just a comment, but it's very interesting because um, both of you spoke and that's what the general notion that I had also that waste once it's all together, it's very difficult to separate it. So to treat it differently or recycle it is becomes very close to impossible because it's, it's very hazardous for people to manually separate the, the waste. But um, last year at an event, I met um, an Indian girl, she's, this, this was an event in India, uh, who of course was told this all her life and she created um, some sort of technology that 
segregates the waste perfectly after it is mixed. I don't know what or like how it precisely that the technology works, but she created a device which segregates basically make mixed municipal solid waste uh, and divides it and then it can be treated. So this is completely without uh, human contact. Basically, you just put all the waste in and um, it comes out segregated. So it's just something I wanted to highlight that there are people doing work like this. I don't know how it actually functions. It sounds like magic to me. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting to point out in this discussion. Can you uh, send me the details for that, for that project or, or whatever, because I'm really interested. Um, I didn't have a, a too close look on, on these separation technologies, but I know also from my company, um, from the research and development that we had a look at, okay, especially the separation from organic waste, um, because this can be treated very well and you wanna keep the nutrition uh, in a cycle, right? But um, yeah, the problem is that you, that the fractions are not very clean. You can maybe sort out uh, that in, in, in some part or uh, up to some extent, but if you have really still dirty fractions, for example, you cannot really use or reuse the or recycle the organic fraction for example and i think that's also a problem with as josh highlighted as well for example if you have plastic with oil and other stuff um that is really it's really difficult then to then yes. to treat further on but that would yeah. be really interesting no it, it is something interesting that i found which is why i thought that it, it would be nice and I'll, I'll share the website with you and um if, i have to look for her card somewhere and i, I will I look for it and I'll send it to you. Perfect, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. If we don't have any more questions or inputs, then uh, I would like to thank you a lot for joining this webinar. And uh, yeah, hope to see you at another point of time, maybe for another webinar or whatever. And uh, wish you a nice weekend. Bye-bye.